Uh, I became involved in 2015, I believe. The director, Doug, was just starting on the project, and he had a couple of research assistants. And one of them saw my name online for um, a lecture that I had, or a presentation I had given about the history of the Hobart building on market at 2nd Street. Um, my company, which is a historic preservation architecture firm, had been working on the building and researching the history, so I was uh, learning about it. And uh, the Hobart building was one of the buildings that Chesley worked on with Willis Polk. So uh, Doug's assistant contacted me. I had never heard of Chesley at that point, uh, partly, I think, because Willis Polk um, took all the credit for himself, <laughs> even though I'm sure he had many people who worked for him. Um, and uh, But I was interested in the project, and so I ended up um, contributing some historic research early on. I did some uh, exploration of projects that Chesley may have worked on with Willis Polk in his early career here in San Francisco. And then another year or so later, um, I uh, did the, the filming and a little bit of narration. Um, and since then, uh, it took another couple of years, I think, for uh, editing, post-editing. And then we've just been um, showing the film, and several of us have uh, attended a few of these types of screenings, which has been really fun to be involved in. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello. Thank you for coming. Um, how I got involved, I, um, almost everybody in this film is a friend of mine. Um, when I did my documentary, The Damnedest Finest Ruins, in 1906, um, I was a, I was a wrestling coach part-time and Ben Burtz, who Ben Burt has won four Oscars for sound effects design. His son was on the wrestling team and that's how I met Ben and um, one day I asked him, I said, I need an editor for my film and Ben said, and he started rattling off days, he said, wait a minute, I'm an editor. And so we started, so we worked together on the film then he went to work for Pixar. So um, I had Craig Barron, uh, who's one of the great matte painting artists in the world and one of the great authorities on it. Um, he's also a friend of mine. And then I believe Doug Stewart had actually seen my documentary and knew that I gave a lot of lectures about San Francisco history. And so um, I probably came at it from a little different perspective. I was not, uh, I, was not I, I knew of uh, Chesley's artwork, but I was not an authority on his art by any stretch. Ben Burton, some of the other folks were. But because of uh, the fact that I was aware that um, his designs had helped to sell the Golden Gate Bridge, um, three quarters of the engineers and architects in the United States said, you can't do this, it's impossible. You, no one had ever built a, bit, a bridge that big. I mean, it is still the most influential bridge in the world. And, um, and to build a tower in, a, in the Pacific Ocean, 65 feet down, with the currents through every day, I mean, it just seemed impossible. So, um, and that, that uh, case on that they built it in, that has the cross section, that actually was washed out by a freak wave and stuff, and the percentage of skeptics went from 75%, probably to 95%, it'll never work. Uh, Robert can talk more about that probably. So they wanted to know from me what I knew about um, building and rebuilding San Francisco afterward, you know, and I knew, I, I did for some weird reason know that Chesley almost fell out of the window. He was, he was quite a carouser uh, to be on the Barbary Coast then until 2.30 in the morning the night before. There were not a lot of savory activities going on in the Barbary Coast. Uh, but I knew some of that stuff. So anyway, that, that's how I got involved. And everyone that Doug kept talking to kept saying, you got to get D'Alessandro down there. He's got an opinion on everything. <laughs> so um, I guess that's how I got here. Uh, I guess, um, is that working? <clears throat> yeah. um, Doug just came to me because he saw the book I did on the dream of space flight. Uh, but the reason I did that book was actually because um, I grew up during the time, as you did, I'm sure, too, um, when Bonnestel was painting um, these uh, pictures for Colliers in the conquest of space. And 
it's something that the film tried to get at, but <clears throat> I don't think really came directly at it, is how, how different the feeling was at that time than it, than it is, became after, the reality, after we saw the reality. It, in the 1950s, there was a, a, a kind of equilibrium or, or balance in, in a small moment of time between the romantic fantasy of space flight on one side, the Buck Rogers, Flash Gordon, the pulps, and the coming reality on the other side, <clears throat> the V2s that sent a second stage outside the atmosphere, and we, we saw that it was going to happen. Um, and the, the two, the, the, the coming reality and, and the old fantasy kind of enhanced each other, and there was a moment when uh, the fantasy was more than fantasy, and the reality was more fantastic than it really became, and it was a unique time to grow up and uh, care about this sort of thing. Um, this was a time when we, we, we still thought that, that there could be people on Mars. I mean, really, in the 1950s, for all we knew, there were, there were people on Mars. I mean, that's how little we knew about planetary surfaces. <coughs> um, a, lot was, a lot was said about Bonasol's accuracy. A lot of things were accurate, a lot of the detail. But the pictures in the conquest of space, for example, um, were not. He had a canal on Mars. He had uh, castle-like rocks on Venus. He had um, a, 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 a liquid gas waterfall on the surface of Jupiter and so on. But they were very romantic images. And, um, and uh, um, just about everyone who became involved in the space program, the engineers, astronauts, scientists, most of them say that Bonestell was a motivation to get into the space program. So, in a way, Bonestell launched the space program. If we'd had some kind of extra powerful telescope and could have seen the barren realities of these of these uh, planetary surfaces, the, the space program might have been delayed uh, for some indefinite period. So, um, Bonestell had that role. But now, some of those paintings really have shifted from scientific <clears throat> art to, to nostalgic art. There's a nostalgia for me. Uh, I cut those pictures out of the conquest of space. <clears throat> I framed them and communed with those pictures on my wall when I was in junior high school and high school. And, and um, I think people born after the moon landing, after the Voyager photographs, can never really f understand the, the feeling that, that my generation had when we had that, that momentary balance of the romance and the, and the reality. Um, it's, um, it's a unique period that'll never, never be again. I got, a, <clears throat> I got involved with this uh, because of not knowing anything about Bonstell's uh, science fiction work, um, but just having discovered his paintings at the bridge. And as art, they were, I can't, uh, you know, I've lost my voice, I just had some surgery. <laughs> It's not, not come back yet, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, is that okay now? Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Um, anyway, so I discovered these paintings at the bridge and that they were artist conceptions done prior and during the construction of the bridge before anybody could really visualize the bridge. And so they were you know, publicity pieces as such. Um, and when I started working toward the bridge in 73, I always say that uh, there were still guys there working at the bridge who had built it. And so it was an interesting time and there was all, you know, stuff and there were files and stuff. And now the files are archives and the stuff are artifacts. Um, as time has gone on, we still don't have a museum. Hopefully there'll be a museum about the bridge someday. But in any case, um, came across the paintings and stuff, and then this uh, Fred Durant, it was, who later wrote a coffee table book, came out in early 2000s um, about Bonstell. And he was a curator at the Smithsonian, and he was putting together a one-man show of <clears throat> Bonstell's space science work. And so in the process of researching it, he'd come across the fact that um, Bonstell had done this stuff about the Golden Gate Bridge, so that was important since the Golden Gate Bridge is so important. So he comes to the Golden Gate Bridge and says the word uh, Bonstell to the receptionist at the Zell, well, you gotta see Bob David. So, so the conversation started and he advised me that Bonstell was still alive and uh, living in Carmel. And so then as a result, I went to see Bonstell. And um, the, uh, among other things, and I brought some little visuals here, this um, particular, Painting here. This is the. You want to take that, Brian? Okay, that's Bonstell. One of the paintings. 
he had never signed. And so that, as said in, in the film, that's him signing it at his table there. And, um, and what I think is so cool is this is a, a view, this is his studio on top of his house in Carmel. And this is a view looking in the other direction of the room. And I was setting up my tripod against the far wall, which is the wall you see here. And that portal is trompe l'oeil. It's painted on the wall. And I had to be two feet away from it to realize it was so good. And it's totally flush. <laughs> it's amazing. I go, gee, it's totally flush. He says, yeah, I painted it there, he says. So anyway, that's just so cool. Um, <laughs> the, uh, also in the, um, in the, this is a, if you, those of you who are Golden Gate Bridge groupies like I am, uh, if you want to come up and look at this later, um, this is that actual painting of the cross section of the South Tower. This was a topic of special interest because the, um, it was such a complicated construction underwater, such immensity and what have you. And he did several cross-sectional views of, of that, uh, of that feature of the bridge. So anyway, um, and then, then this is him sitting with that painting. And my friend Mary Russell, who's with me here, um, she would come with me when, to, when I visited the Bonstels in Carmel. Uh, she's in the picture, but she's in back holding the painting vertically. <laughs> so anyway, so then um, the film, um, about five years ago, Doug Stewart come to, comes to the bridge and uh, contacts our public information officer, uh, whose last name is also David, like mine, Priya David. Um, and you'll see her on KQED starting in the near future. She just left the, the bridge last week take, to take a new job. She's gonna be doing, I forget what it's called, but it's that uh, feature that Belva Davis used to do, um, commentary on news and things, but I forget what it's called. Anyway, so he contacted Priya, Doug Stewart, the film producer, and so oh, you gotta see Bob David. And so then he was just so gratified when he met me that I had actually met Bonstell in person and did these photographs among others and what have you. So that's how I got into the film and the history of Bonstell and the Golden Gate Bridge. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all of you for, uh, for talking about that. Um, mm -hmm. Another question, uh, well, one thing um, I, uh, uh, I have to confess that I didn't know Bonestell before um, we put together this uh, whole program. Um, and so, uh, and of course in, uh, in the movie and el elsewhere you find that he's sort of referred to as like a forgotten artist or nearly forgotten artist. Um, why do you think um, he's nearly forgotten? Anyone have thoughts on that? Well, um, half the people in America can't tell you who the vice president is. So um, the fact that we are, I don't mean to denigrate my country here. I'm an Italian citizen as well. Uh, and speak the language quite well. And when you go there, they can give you chapter and verse and everything that's happened in 2,500 years. For some reason, America is a strange place. Maybe it's because we're not a homogenous people. We're a, you know, we're a polyglot. And... Um, I don't know, it just seems we don't care as much. You know, it's strange. Um, so it's very easy for things to fall by the wayside. And, and, and I think there was a point in the film that made a very good one. How many of you folks, by the way, as long as you were asking us questions, did not know much or, or anything about Chesley when this started? Almost everybody in here. Did you find it interesting? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, this is a, this is about this is a fun part, I guess. What the four of us do, you know, four of us sitting up here, is you get to learn about things, you know. So I, I guess somebody said to me one time, they said, you know, "Mr. Dull, son, if people taught history the way you do it, I would have paid attention." I said, "I got news for you. If they did it the way I do it, I would have paid attention." Um, so I just think I don't know. Maybe we have the wrong approach to it. You know, maybe maybe memorizing the dates is not as interesting as the crazy characters. But as it said in the film here, the reality of what transpired replaced Chesley's interpretations or imagination. 
But, you know, as Wentz said here, without that, that wouldn't have happened. You know, the Golden Gate Bridge might not have been built if, if Chesley had not told people it's going to be beautiful. That's the first time I've ever saw, I had ever seen that, that horrible rendering of how they wanted to build the bridge. <laughs> I've never seen that before, and I've been doing lectures on that bridge for a long time. Really? And I'd never seen that drawing. Huh. So I guess, I, I guess it just... Chesley became obsolete. Maybe that's the simple answer, right? He just he, they out they outdid him eventually with science. Well, I, I think that the, from all the talk of accuracy, that there really was a lot of inaccuracy, and they, they don't <clears throat> the, the pictures of the solar surfaces of solar planets were were not what we found in the Voyager photographs. So so they're really. Um, um, People that, that didn't grow up with those pictures don't understand the romantic uh, feeling that uh, that they that they uh, that they had that they no longer have because we know they're not not that the reality is anything less. The re it's kind of a shift from uh, romantic wonder to intellectual wonder, which is probably uh, has a lot more depth and, and meaning. But uh, but I think they they serve their their purpose at their time, and when the generation that grew up with them is gone. Um, I think maybe a lot of a lot will be lost about what who he was and what he was. And I would just say that after he passed away and wasn't continuing to produce artwork, um, his pieces are in some collections, mm -hmm. private collections and otherwise, and they've been shown at certain exhibitions, but they're not um, readily available all the time for people to see and access. Um, so actually, that's one of the great things about this film is that we've been able to share Chesley's story to a lot of people who hadn't been exposed before to his work. I think another th uh, amazing thing to me about um, uh, the film and, and Chesley Bonestell is, is how many different things he did. He, you know, he helped with architectural design and, uh, you know, went to Hollywood and helped with the, the um, films there and then, of course, had um, a whole career with uh, the, the space art or science fiction art. Um, as far as architectural goes, um, Christina, uh, how many other buildings did he work on in San Francisco? Um. So he was most known for working on the Hobart building and Filoli. I believe he assisted with a handful of other uh, projects for Willis Polk early on in the teens. Um, then he left and went to New York and came back and worked on projects in the 1930s, which included the bridge as well as some um, work for the, the Golden Gate International Exposition on Treasure Island. Uh, I think um, partly he he was really an illustrator. He rendered these images. He showed what they would look like, what these buildings would look like once they were completed uh, versus being a, a technical architect who was doing the blueprints. I didn't really find any architectural drawings with his name on them, um, but he was publicized in architectural journals, which is what I was researching, uh, because he was showing these beautiful illustrations of what the Hobart building would look like once it was completed, things for advertising the projects, um, and was really talented with perspective, which I think then lent itself to his later work, both with the Hollywood map painting and his space art, his understanding of, of space and perspective. But, but, can I ask you a question? Wasn't his um, effect on New York more significant than it was in San Francisco, the Chrysler building, and some others? I think he got, look, when, they, when Doug asked me to participate, I do what I always do. I start researching because, you know, I mean, I, I know what I know, maybe what I can contribute, but I'm interested in the whole story. It certainly seemed to me, Willis Polk was one of those guys um, who took all the credit or as much credit as he could possibly get. And when, he, when Chesley went to New York, um, they gave him more f free reign, I think, as I read and I understand it, if I'm accurate, you can question that. But he started to design buildings from the outside in. In other words, it wasn't like they didn't do the structural stuff and then bring Chesley in to do the skeleton. Chesley started imagining things. He started saying, well, we could do this or we could do that. And then this sort of um, 
you know, uh, form follows function is the architectural adage, but in this case, it certainly seemed like Chesley, you know, Chesley's conceptions of what they should be and uh, unique uh, looks that he could bring to the buildings, you know, were the, were the focal point as opposed to, as you said, the nuts and bolts. That's, that's what I gleaned from reading it. He, he really came into his own in, in New York more than here. Is that, is that accurate? Is that well, he, it was his early career when he was working here. So uh, certainly I would expect that he would have developed in his skills over the years. Um, so the, the early teens compared to the, oops, sorry, the 20s when he was in New York. It just appeared he got more um, opportunity and respect, and they knew that he was so good that they let him um, go to the forefront more in, in, in New York than they did here. That's what I, that's what I seen, everything I read indicated that. Thank you. Um, so we have, let's see, we have about uh, another um, 15 minutes here. Um, I would like to open up uh, to some questions. Um, I'm going to go to the back because I saw this this arm uh, go up first, and if you don't mind asking into the microphone. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I knew a lot about Chesley's art because I bought the two books, his first two books as a boy, and was very stimulated. But I didn't know anything about the Golden Gate Bridge and about the buildings. So this is a wonderful broadening of my mind about him. Uh, two quick questions. If I show up tomorrow at the administration building at the Golden Gate Bridge, can I see these things? Are they open to the public? Uh, well, the administration building is, is exactly that. If you have business there, you come in and speak to the receptionist and go from there. On days of board meetings, um, which are the, uh, I think they're always, they've, I'm semi-retired now. I'm not keeping track of things as I used to. Um, if you look on the Golden Gate Bridge website, there is a calendar of events for the board of directors. And it'll show that on the, the fourth Fridays of every month is a board meeting. And the board meetings are open to the public. So you come in, up okay. stairs to the, the second meetings floor. are in the they, board meeting. They're actually hanging in the hallway outside the board meeting, about outside the boardroom on okay. the second floor. And sometimes just walk in and, and ask and say, you're interested in seeing the the the, the Bonstel paintings. Uh, use my name, depending on who you talk to, you'll be welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, I, I seem to remember. Um, There's only four of them on the wall right now. Right now well, so. it's four more than I know about. Mm -hmm. um, I seem to remember as a boy also watching the Walt Disney show. Yeah. And I believe they showed the Collier's images in their construction about going into space. Am I, am I correct that those were Bonestell's images that Walt Disney used in his TV show? I, I don't, I don't, are you asking me? I, I don't uh, know if they, Disney used the Collier's images. I don't, I don't remember. Well, Werner Von Braun was always on the Disney show, if you recall. <laughs> And in that context, he must have brought in the images. I, I believe they were, actually. Uh, I believe they were. The, it's because um, a lot of his rockets, about this much I do know, were um, he was a f fanatic um, for trying to be accurate. Obviously, when he was doing the moon early, he was inventing things. But when he started to work with Werner von Braun, um, he based his paintings on the science. He knew that they, that for instance, when, when you left the earth and for, for the atmosphere, that the rockets had to separate. You couldn't carry that massive rocket with you, so it'd go in different segments. So you got down to the, to the smallest of the capsules. John Kennedy, from what I, I've read and been told, um, read the work of Werner von Braun and saw Chesley's drawings, and that's why he made that. I always thought that was at his inauguration, but it wasn't. It was later on when he said, we'll, we'll send a man to the moon in this decade and bring him back safely. That was directly based. Werner von Braun in the 1950s said, we can do this. We can go to the moon and come back. And he hired Chesley for a symposium to do the artwork. <laughs> on that, and you know, because he was clever on Brown. He knew that if people could visualize it, that it would be a hell of a lot better than reading his complex mathematical formulas. And I, John, I know, I know reasonably sure that, that was John Kennedy's uh, 
inspiration for picking He was a very forward-thinking guy, John Kennedy. I thought he was a great president and a brilliant guy. Um, so, yeah, I, I do believe that th that's accurate. I'm pretty sure about that. Okay, more questions uh, down here. Um, maybe this is a question for you, Christina, but anyone who knows. Um, regarding photographs of Chesley Bonestell himself when he was young, and, um, and particularly that photograph in Willis Polk's office showing all the staff, I think, Chesley's one. Do you know where those photographs can be found? Who has the rights? I'm not sure. I didn't find that one myself. Doug, Doug would know that. Um, I think the Doug, the producer's assistants, found that one. Uh, but it could be here at the History Room in, in the San Francisco Library. I don't think so. Um, or the California Historical Society. Um, other. Uh, Repositories include the um, UC Berkeley Environmental Design Archives. That what, have what's in the coffee table book? Yeah, I've that seen. Came, I've seen Fred it Durant. in one of the in books. Book, so the the uh, credit for it must how, be in the book. How about Chesley Bonestell's own papers or collection? Uh, I'm guessing it might have come from his family, but no one knows. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Other, Other questions? questions? Over here. I have a comment and a uh, question. The comment about the Chrysler building, I worked across the street from that in Manhattan. It's on Lexington Avenue. And if you ever get to New York and you'd be interested to see an extremely well-preserved Art Deco monument, that's the building to see. It's gorgeous. The lobbies, the outside gargoyles, well, everything we've got there makes it a fascinating building to see. My question is, um, how did the U.S. government, who led this pursuit of von Braun when the German missile development program was absolutely top secret, was actually done in uh, Poland rather than Germany, uh, who led this initiative of seeing the importance of getting someone like Von Braun, who could join a, a group and point out where other talent existed in the German retreating armies. There was a, a, a program after the war to bring German scientists over here. I forget the name. It was Operation something. I can't think of the name of it now. But uh, they brought all kinds of scientists over, and Von Braun was one of them. Um, there's a story about uh, he was trying to escape uh, the uh, and uh, he was getting away from the Russians, and he went into the American zone, and, and uh, uh, he was stopped there, and, and uh, uh, the rest is history. They, they brought him over here. Um, uh, um, I can't think of the name of that program, but, uh, but many, many of the German scientists were brought over here after, right after the war. There's an interesting little aside, a uh, humorous aside on, on Kennedy's decision to go to the moon. Everybody knows that, that it was mainly to beat the Russians as far as the political uh, aspect of it. And apparently he asked his science advisor <clears throat> what we could do to beat the Russians. And his first idea was, could we desalinate the sea? And the science advisor said, no, you couldn't do that. And so then he just uh, came up, uh, the idea came to them, maybe we could go to the moon. American and British intelligence knew who the geniuses were in the German military, and they also knew that Russia was going to be their next enemy. So the big rush was to get every one of the top German scientists before the Russians got them. I don't know the name of the program, but I can't remember. Yeah, but they 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 wanted all, they, that was a, they they had them targeted. Von Braun and all those guys, that they were going to snatch him before the Russians got him. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a big part of the program. Sorry. I want to thank you for this program. It was absolutely fascinating. It seems like uh, Chelsea was the unsung hero, kind of behind a lot of inspiration for the bridge and for the space program. Um, but I'm sitting here just so curious about those S's in his name and just wondering if there's any special symbol, symbolic meaning to that um, S for space. 
Uh, is it some kind of secret code that he got from the <laughs> from uh, some uh, outer space? Um, is there any meaning to those? No we have stumped the authors. <laughs> <laughs> I do this every year. I do lectures. I said, I you get me twice a year. You just got me, and it's only February. Because <laughs> uh, I, I noticed at the very end, he was still putting that little, and I thought it was a kind of a slip of his uh, hand at that age, but now I'm seeing it. Now it was very purposeful. Yeah. But when he signed the painting in 82, or 83, I guess it was, of that painting, it was obviously... Not as steady as it used to be, but he still had those little details. Yes, <laughs> he did. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. oh, I'd like to add one more th th comment too uh, on, in terms of Bonstell and the bridge and overall. I do a lecture about the history of the bridge uh, frequently, and in it, um, the architects for the bridge was a husband-wife team by the name of Irving and Gertrude Morrow. Uh, er, Gertrude was one of the first women to graduate in architecture at Berkeley, uh, and they they had a firm. They called themselves Morrow and Morrow. They were in the De Young Building on Market Street, and they were referred to Joseph Strauss, the engineer of the bridge, by among other by, I uh, interestingly by um, Maynard Dixon, the painter. And at that time, Maynard Dixon, the painter, was married to Dorothea Lang, the photographer. And so the Morrows and Morrow and Morrow and Maynard Dixon and Chesley Bonstell, I attribute to be the artistic consortium that des decided the bridge would be orange. And that, that's a big deal because bridges were always gray or there was a pale green they used sometimes, and sometimes absolute black. And so the Golden Gate Bridge being orange was a big, big deal when it was done, and of course it's part of its landmark uh, feature. So anyway, I put that on the table for you. Uh, and Maynard Dixon and Dorothy Lang at that time lived on Gough Street between uh, Green and Vallejo, which happens to be near where I live. I never knew them, of course, way before my time. But in any case, uh, Bonstell and uh, uh, Strauss would visit them there at the house, uh, along with the Morrows and stuff. And so there was this ongoing thing. I was in touch with the Dixon's two sons in the 1980s, and so I got the dinner table talk from the 1930s. And uh, so it was just interesting to hear about that happening. So, and picking up on Maynard Dixon and stuff, you know, his paintings now, we have a Maynard Dixon painting at the bridge. It's right in the main lobby as soon as you walk in on the left. It's large, 40 by 60, unusual for Maynard Dixon. And, but you look at it and you say, oh my God, that's Maynard Dixon. And it's signed as well. But um, in any case, uh, when we, we had an exhibit about the bridge at the California Historical Society for the 75th anniversary of the bridge in 2012. And it was the first time that this artwork, the Dixon and the Bonstell pieces and some other feet pieces uh, left the building and went down to the Historical Society for the sake of the uh, installation there. And they were there almost a full year at the California Historical Society on Mission Street. And the, um, so they had, a, for the first time ever, these things had to be appraised to be insured to be transported. And, uh, and the, they, Praise the Bonstell pieces at about fifty thousand each, um, especially the large one, and then but the bon, the Dixon one they praised at uh, only one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and I said, said, wait a minute, his stuff goes for one to two million, and they said, well, it's not his seminal work. I go, but yeah, it's not his grandmother's rocking chair. It's the Golden Gate Bridge, <laughs> you know, and and of course then I realized later the job of this appraiser was to lowball it for the sake of the insurance premium. So anyway, that's a little aside on art. And Any other questions? OK, one question over here. Hi, thank you very much for the movie. Uh, we all really appreciated it. Uh, the Operation Paperclip was the name of the that's it, mission that's right, to that's right. capture the journalists. Operation Paperclip? Paperclip yes, it was right. a, a book <laughs> that came out three or four yeah. years ago by the same title. It was fascinating to read. Yeah. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, one, 
in the lobby of the administration building on Treasure Island, there's some really interesting murals that show uh, recovery of capsules in the ocean. Is there any connection to Bonneslaw with those? And second question, I was really interested to hear about the uh, connection between uh, Buckminster Fuller and Bonnestall. Do you, can you tell us anything more about collaborations or conversations or information about that relationship? Thank you. He only said he was here for dinner that night with Ansel Adams. That's how I learned about it. I talked about it later with Ansel Adams a few months later. He corroborated the story. Um, but what the real connection with Buck, Bucky Fuller was, I'm not sure, other than the fact that you know, they're visionaries in that same aura of things, you know, structures and uh, um, you know, domes, et cetera, and what have you. Uh, I suspect, and again, the coffee table book by Durant uh, about Bonstell uh, would be the primary source to really get into all the deta details of this stuff. So it came out in, I guess, 2005 or something like that. I don't know of any connection with the murals in, in the Treasure Island building. I don't think that there is one. I, I have a question about his biography, some of the details. It, it seems like he did not want for female companionship ever in his <laughs> life. Does anyone have any uh, insights into his uh, charisma or his uh, um, dating secrets? He seemed to have quite an uh, interesting <laughs> life. My only observation was the guy spent a hell of a lot of time on the Barbary Coast. Yeah, um, he started, and, he started um, out early. Like, yeah. I, like I said, there, there, there were no churches on the Barbary Coast that I know of. <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it made Storyville, New Orleans look tame. Mm -hmm. um, and he was there a lot. <laughs> um, so it just seemed like... Um, he was, you know, I, I don't know that much about his life, but it always stuck out to me that he, he was there a lot, starting as a teenager, I mean, reasonably young, like 15, 16 years old. You know, it's amazing he didn't get shanghaied. Um, which would, so we would have a slightly different story, I think, probably wouldn't be here if that had happened. He what? Rowdy. Mm. Rowdy? Yeah, just acting up. And, and later, um, I think I read a story, don't quote me, but this is my memory of what I've read that happened to Carmel once, not when he lived there, but much, much earlier. He and some other guys would just drink a lot and go <laughs> racing in their car down the highway. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I guess, yeah, a little bit, yeah. And Hulda, his wife, when I met him, which was his fourth but fourth wife, third woman, um, <laughs> del delightful person of all sorts. And uh, when he passed away in 86, she, she stayed in touch, and she was classic old-time letter writer and would send us letters and things. And then she her, she wanted to go to the top of the Golden Gate Bridge and and stuff, and uh, so in her late 80s, after she had just had a hip replacement, I took her up there, and um, she was just wonderful character. I mean, just uh, fabulous, so. So we have uh, time for just one last question here. Yeah, thank you guys for your contributions to this beautiful homage. I was wondering, um, since you guys seem to have a rich, vast, like, history and of storytelling for San Francisco. Is there something in the water from Hetch Hetchy with the Imagineering where a lot of these like these storytellers, for either through paintings or like Lucas films, have set their imaginations into reality by coalescing these sort of, the, what you were saying, the, the, the space art sort of led to that exploration of Warner Braun, even the, the Golden Gate Bridge uh, example where these artists came together. Are there other stories that you guys could share from local residents? Well, artists who've changed things? Well, like, uh, it's imagineered, like sort of set, set a tone of coalescing what the future could look like and sort of well, possible. Um, probably, yeah, but maybe not so much in painting. I mean, Allen Ginsberg and Lauren Ferlinghetti changed America. Um, Allen Ginsberg's howl changed American poetry in 1956 or 57. The United States Supreme Court struck down the obscenity laws um, because of Howell. 
you know. Um, and um, I mean, Lawrence Ferlinghetti was a submarine commander in the Second World War. I've known him for 50 years, you know. He was a great mentor and friend to me. And he only opened that bookstore because he married a Southern Belle with a lot of money. And he just decided he was going to do something different, you know. He, and um, so there's a lot of visionaries. So, the, so I mean, that just just think of what that grew into. That grew into the hippie movement. That grew into the environmental movement. That grew into the summer of love. That grew into, you know, San Francisco was a conservative city. San Francisco had nothing but conservative mayors and 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 crazy police chiefs, and and we're quite a bit different from that now, you know. So, um, I, I believe that. Um, the city of San Francisco has had a, had a profound effect on world culture that's unequaled by any other modern city. I mean, just look at that little area down there um, uh, it, from the 1840s, where you know when the city was first discovered in 1776, when it was first discovered by the Spaniards. I mean, um, Levi Strauss and and uh, modern banking with um, you know with um, A. P. Giannini. And all the things that, that happened, the television was invented uh, in San Francisco, the corner of Green and, forget what's, what the cross street was, there's a little, Sansom, uh, yeah. So, um, well, look what George Lucas did, you know, not necessary for the better if you've seen movies lately, um, uh, to some degree. You know, I, I don't. I don't have nothing against that stuff. I have all the other stuff disappeared. All, all the all the dramatic stuff. No one would make Chinatown today or on the waterfront. You know, so it, I think it's just. I think Chesley was one person who had an influence on a certain field in a city that um, has a habit of of influencing the world, uh, disproportionate to its size. You know. I think it's extraordinary what, what has happened here. That's, I've been studying this now all my adult life, and I, I'm just constantly amazed. This is just one other chapter in my amazement, and I don't even know why I'm sitting here. I mean, it just was a weird thing that I got plucked to, to, to do this, and I was knocked out by the opportunity. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs>